nothing the screen has ever shown before can surpass the thrills of the underwater kaiju from out of space podcast created from an atomic fireball hurled from outer space the underwater kaiju from out of space podcast threatens man's very existence on earth The Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space Podcast. Battles Godzilla, Mothra, and Rodan for mastery of the world. Men quake before the terror of their unleashed fury. All new, all never to be forgotten. A new high in... Visions from Monster Land. Hello everyone, welcome to Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, where we bring you those visions from Monsterland. My name is Jerry, and joining me, as always, is Mr. Venom. Greetings and salutations, Kaiju lovers. Derek. My nose is very drilly today. (laughs) And, of course, Don. Screonk, everyone. I don't know why I did that, like, like, y'all can't see, but I had my hand up and I was, like, pointing... To different places in my room, <laughs> like it was an actual talk show. Jerry forgot how to podcast. I did. This is who fucking podcast right anymore. Anyway, guys, we are back after what uh, has been a, I don't know year, six months, eight months. Who who keeps count? There's no one that that is like writing on a wall, just scratching in every month that underwater kaiju isn't here. But we're back. And we've got a, a dose of Gamera and a dose of Ultraman. Or as Derek has labeled this show, Drill Nose Fish and Rainbow Lizards. <laughs> Which is a perfect name, and I love it. I love it so much that when I saw it, I cracked up. So, with that being said, uh, thank you all for being patient with me. I am back to making podcasts. Thank you to my co-hosts who are here with me to talk about some Japanese big time monster monster battles and with that being said today we are covering the movie Gamera vs. Barugon from 1966 a giant monster that emits a destructive ray from its back attacks Japan and takes on Gamera um, directed by Shigeo Tanaka, um, which he's directing it because Noriaki Yusu. Uh, how do you say that name, Don? Yuasa. 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 Uh, he was. Dai basically don't let him do B movies, and this one got an A budget, so they they made someone else direct it. Uh, written by Nissan Taka Takahashi. Takaha- yeah, Takahashi. Yeah, baby. Look at the talent. I've been I've been not practicing at all. This is the second of the Gamera movies. We get to see Gamera in full color this time. In all of his splendid glory. And we are about to dive into, first of all, what we love. And normally I go last. But since this is my favorite Gamera movie of all time, I'm going first. So suck it, nerds. Um, the reason I love this movie is not because of Gamera, um, though I do love Rainbow Horny Puppy Dog Lizard Barugon. I, my favorite thing about this movie is actually the first half of the movie, where it's all just these characters. It it's for a Gamera movie. It's very adult. There's no fucking kids, which I know Venom was super excited about. Um, but it's this story of these guys that are going to go, uh, find this opal on a mysterious island. Well, I mean, not that mysterious, but it feels like a mysterious island. And then they're going to sell the opal and they're all like kind of shady and doing shady shit. And one of them's like extremely shady. 
and he kind of like ends up figuring out a way to like kill everyone and get the opal <laughs> so he can sell that shit on his own and then he comes back and then he beats up an old crippled dude and shit <laughs> it's it's wonderful this is also my favorite uh, mystery science theater 3000 episode of all time um it is fantastic i highly recommend you watch this as a mystery science episode it's amazing so yeah for me it's the characters in this one that make it for me it's just fantastic i love it with that being said since there are no children here we're gonna pass it to venom and ask <laughs> venom what do you love about this movie Honestly, I, I really, really enjoy the simple, easy-to-follow story. I, I hear a lot of people complain about kaiju movie storylines, that sometimes they get a little convoluted with, like, Weapon 13 B-12 and, and Rocket Ship X-5 or whatever. And this one is a very simple story. You know, we've got the Opal. We've got a group of people going back to get the Opal. They get the Opal. Shit hits the fan. It's simple. It's easy to follow. It's It's probably one of my favorite storylines of a Gamera film. Yeah, it's greedy people who don't listen to the natives and just steal their shit. Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, you, you've got a little bit of uh, social commentary right there, honestly, with the lack of respect for the natives, the the supposed New Guineans, as they called them in the movie, but yeah. yeah none of them look commentary. that new, to no, be honest they, with you. they all look Japanese. And none of them were were like three inches long and covered with hair like this fur and adorable so i don't know those why are, they're named that those are old guineas no oh okay either. this is new guinea yeah <laughs> okay gotcha that makes I'll sense just, it's off that none of them were italians <laughs> <laughs> um okay derek what did you love about this movie well um i, I like the little puppy dog lizard Darugan. I like how goofy he looks when he's walking. He's so silly with his bulgy eyes. I love his rhino horn. I um, love his rainbow. Let's not forget about his lovely, lovely tongue. That shoots freeze rays. <laughs> like, That's that tongue, cool. boy? Whoo, it looks like it's got a Mike Tyson sucker punch. Yeah, it's pretty great. And I like, like it, 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 it's good to see, like, Gamera actually, like, this is like the first monster that Gamera fought, and I did like that. It was like a quadruped pred monster walking on all fours. And, you know, he, he had some interesting weaknesses, and uh, we'll get into those later, but it's kind of weird. He makes him the Wicked Witch of the West, you know. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool-looking like little design, and I, I like how he walks and the shit in the movie. All right, Don, what did you love about this movie? All right, uh, well, first of all, uh, this should be mentioned that um, other than uh, the original, from which I've seen both the Japanese version and the American um, inner splice, cut up, uh, whatever you want to call it, version, uh, Gamera, Guardian of the Universe, and uh, Gamera the Brave, all of the Gamera films are first-time watches. I haven't seen any of them. So, yeah, this was uh, kind of interesting. And it was uh, an aspect you touched on with the uh, enhanced budget. And to me, I, I was really impressed with the special effects work throughout here. Uh, not just with the military battles, but, you, you know, the battle, the, you know, the stuff that you get with Baragon's uh, rampage, you know, because you have to freeze everything. So you have to have that layer of frost over all the buildings. But then, you know, you still have to add all, like, the fire and explosions and, like, all the miniatures and they get destroyed in the rampage i was really impressed with all that all right yeah um our director from the first gamer movie handled uh director of special effects for this movie since he wasn't allowed to direct the whole movie because he doesn't get direct uh top a cut budgets he's a b man he's a he's a roger corman type man um so so every other gamer movie you're saying correct <laughs> pretty much uh, so I, they slowly start going into sea gray territory, but that's, oh, really? that's a discussion for another time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Like the last, the sea world one. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. The, um, the last movie in like the that's, Showa era, that's Jagger, right? um, yeah, Zegra. Zegra, okay. yeah. Which I actually, oh, I like Zegra. Okay. Yeah. Zegra's the last one. Okay. No, no, no. The <laughs> last movie 
in the Gamera Showa series is basically just them, like, reusing tons of footage. It oh, looks like a fucking clip movie. Super Monster is part of the Showa series? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, I know what it is, yeah, because I'm always used to associating Showa with 75 because of the Godzilla series. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I get it now, I get it now, I know what you're talking about, but yeah. It's just, I, I've always associated, like, if it was in the 70s, it's Showa, and then from then on, it's Heizai, but yeah, no, I, I get what you're talking about now, yeah. All right. Yes, sir. And now we move on to what we didn't like in this film. And uh, I only really have one small gripe with the film. And it's my same gripe for uh, Friday the 13th Part 2. Oh. We didn't need the intro. Like, we, like, this movie came out like eight months after the first Gamera movie. No one needs a recap of the first Gamera movie. We don't need to know the ending of that movie. Get us into the action, for fuck's sake. I don't, like, we don't need to know that he got shot in space and came back and all this nonsense. Let's let's get to it. Um, and the American dub is just, like, the narrator for the American dub for that part is just... Uh, his voice is just very boring. Like, I don't know. It's like a cocky scientist. But but who doesn't have... Like, cocky in that he knows what he's saying is right, but he doesn't have, like, the balls to back it up. So it's not like he's like, and then we sent Gamera to space, and that bitch came back. No, he's just like, and then we put Gamera in a spaceship that clamped together you see it was project x and then we shot him into space but oh no an asteroid hit it it's no let's get into my boys and their crazy hijinks with guns and caves and scorpions like let's go um venom what did you not like about the movie uh honestly uh, one of my biggest issues with it is just going to be the lack of gamera Gamera is not in this very much. I mean, we, we maybe get three total set pieces with Gamera in the film. And during the second set piece, he gets frozen by Baragon's, you know, ice attack. And then he's he's literally forgotten about for like a half hour of the film. We, we literally go another half hour just following Baragon, which, you know, it, it isn't that bad and that big an issue honestly but i mean if you're tuning in to see gamera uh yeah expect a lot more baragon yeah that was the problem with with this movie is that uh because there were no children they had to keep getting gamera from the playground he kept wandering off set and going to a playground and they had to keep bringing him back uh i'm really surprised gamera has not had charges brought up on him to be honest his sponsor is Zach Galifianakis in The Hangover. His his spo- his sponsor is Roman Polanski and Victor Salva. Um, <laughs> oh, terrible. Throw, Willie, throw Woody Allen in there too. Yeah. No, no, Gamer never touched anyone that he helped raise. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, Jerry, before you um, go forth, I want to jump in real fast because my flaw actually touches on Venom's. Okay. Because I had the same issue. I had the same issue with it, but mine was only because Gamera, while he's not on screen, you know, all that much, there's no real reason for him to fight Baragon. They come up with this flimsy excuse <laughs> that he's attracted to the rainbow, but then there's like, oh crap, all of a sudden Gamera just appears out of nowhere because Baragon shot the rainbow. Like, there's no real reason for him to even be there, and then he's forgotten about for half an hour, and then, oh, crap, the thing's going to thaw out, Gamera's here to save the day, and attacks Baragon again. Yeah, they're it's just like... Just that, it's just not like... It's not like, you know, we don't get up very much of him to begin with, it's that when, you know, the very little that we get him, there's no reason for him to be there. Oh. Gamera loves energy, so when oh, Baragon shoots his rainbow... He feels that energy. It's actually that that uh, uh, Gamera is just upset that uh, while Baragon was showing his pride, Gamera's upset that they won't add the letter P to that alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious how Don's gonna feel when he watches Gamera versus Jiger. Oh Jesus Christ! Let's let's not get into that heartbreak yet. Yeah, we have time. 
Uh, cause, but Don is right because, like, at least when Gamera like disappears in say like Gamera Guardian of the Universe, it's because he got a shit fucked up and he needs time to heal. You know, yeah. we get that. You know, in his connection with the girl, he's at least moving up to Kibafile levels and dating girls that have had their period. So that's better, at least. Um, I'm sure Steven Seagal turned a blind eye to that one. But uh, that leaves us with Derek. Derek, what did you not like about this movie? Honestly, that's that's actually the only thing I dislike, too, is the amount of Garamora. It's, it's, this movie is pretty much one of the best in the series of the Showa. I, um, it's, not, it's not my favorite, but it's still... One of the best. Made so it's ones. it's funny because with this movie, they actually uh, it, it originally planned to be a bit darker and more mature. <clears throat> um, in fact, a lot of the women on the island were supposed to be topless, but they decided to still keep it in the age range for children to go. But they realized with this movie that the children were restless sitting through all the uh, adult storylines, and so that's yeah. why. With the first one, there was a kid that connected to the kid. So that's why after this, it goes back to every movie having a fucking child into it. Or at least that's their cover story. We know the real reason, Gamera. You're not fooling us. Oh, yeah. Fucking. Oh, yeah. And it, but... Gamera was too busy listening to uh, R. Kelly music. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> fucking awful like i'm saying this shit and this is literally my favorite gamer movie mm. um so let's talk but y'all are right the the and probably that's why we got the intro because they know they weren't going to give us gamer for so fucking long that they were like look this it, is a gamer movie we swear and that's why we have the intro my, i don't know if this is going to be a spoiler but this is kind of like the same thing i feel about attack on legion too oh god yeah we won't get into that because don yeah. hasn't seen it and when we go back to visiting the the '90s trilogy, which is some of the best kaiju movies ever made, um, we want Don to come into those fresh. So, yeah. with that being said, let's talk about Baragon. I love Baragon. I got a toy of him um, about six months ago. It's not a big one. It's like kind of a standard six inch one, um, kind of like about the same quality as like a Japanese Bandai. It actually might be a Bandai. I'm not 100% sure. It could be. I know they put out a few of them Bandais. Um yeah, uh Baragon toys really don't aren't that great, I'll be honest with you, just cuz he he's kind of when you get him in toy form, he's kind of generic. In the movie he's awesome because, you know, he's got a rainbow attack and a punching tongue and can freeze shit like this dude has superpowers on top of superpowers, but Derek, wh what is his weakness again? I'm water, H2O. Yeah, he dies from water. And fun fact, though, the suit wouldn't sink in the water, and that's why they had to cut it up. Oh, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that, yeah. <laughs> I kind of got the idea because you could tell that there's all that purple gunk and they're trying to hide everything that they cut everything together because that's not the suit that sinks because you see him just bobbing on the surface and then all of a sudden when he sinks it's the mo it's the miniature model it's not the suit so I, I i kind of got the idea from watching that and just knowing how to spot these kinds of things that that's what happened that they couldn't get the suit to sink which is actually kind of weird because normally these suits take to water like fish take to water so, yeah, not getting it to sink seems kind of weird, but, yeah, uh, I, I kind of figured that from just watching it that that was the case, that they just somehow couldn't get it to sink in the in sink properly, so they had to switch it out. Yeah, which proves gay people float on water. That's how you can tell. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, yeah, Baragon, in the movie, looks awesome. He's a, he's a great choice. It reminds me of, of Godzilla Raids again, where they bring in, you know, a monster that walks on all fours to battle a monster that walks on on two, you know the quad versus the bi, um, which you know Baragon. And of course, you've got the spikes on the back. There's another little connection there. The spikes on the back, the horn on the nose. Correct. Yeah. So it kind of it works out very well. Uh, Gamera in this movie, 
Uh, he looks good, you know. He, he, he's got a few updates. We get to see him in his full color. We get to see his spinny jet, which I love seeing his spinny jet, personally. Um, but yeah, he looks good in color. I'm a big fan of, of the storyline. I agree with y'all. Should have been more gamma action. But at least this time in a gamma movie, I like the storyline. Because in, in the Showa series, that ain't always the case. Um, so with that being said, uh, Venom, do you have any last words you want to say on the movie? Onadera is just an absolute idiot. I I, I really I, I wanted to be on board for a human antagonist. I I always like to be on board with the human antagonists in kaiju movies, but this guy is just one of the worst. He's absolutely terrible. Uh, and honestly, as terrible as he is, uh, the Navy is even more terrible to let a single armed man get onto one of their ships, take uh whatever, uh, take the diamond. I guess uh, by yes. that time the opal was done. So, yeah, just take the diamond around multiple armed cadets or, or seamen, whatever you want to call those guys, and and then just walk away. It's like, that doesn't make any sense. In America, he would have gotten shot 44 times Here's the before thing. he even got on the boat. You call him an idiot, but let's not let's look at his track record. He stole the diamond on a boat full of the fucking Japanese Navy. I'm not saying he's talented, but, I mean, that speaks for herself. He was able to get into the group, go into the group, talk. He had to lie through his teeth and say, friendship's all that matters to me, as he watched the dude get stung by a scorpion. Mm. Uh, he throws, like, four bombs at the dude. He throws dude. bombs at him. He's like, oh, sure, you can have the gun. I'll just take the opal. And then causes a fucking cave-in. Like, yeah, he's like the Green Goblin, like, ah, here you go, Spider-Man. Yeah, <laughs> he, he's he got balls of steel, because when the, when the ship cr sinks, he's like, bro, we gotta get down there and get the opal now. Fuck this monster, let's go. And old grandpa's like, no, let's cut our loss, blah, blah, blah. And so he beats the shit out of uh, old grandpa, who old grandpa fights unfair, using a weapon against him. Using a crutch, that crutch is meant to help you walk, not hit people with, you asshole. Oh, and then you're going to have your wife jump into it, two on one? This isn't WWE in the 1990s on Sunday Night Heat. We don't do that here. You need to learn to fight fair. But my boy goes, it's fine, I'll take both of you on, you can use a weapon, and he runs that shit. So, you say idiot, I say... The next James Bond villain. Oh, God. I, I, call, I, call, I call him Japanese John Boy and Anaconda. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I'll go with that. Derek that's ain't a, wrong. Yeah, that's a, that's a good comparison. I like that. Even, he even gets eaten like John Boy did. Didn't John Boy really? play, uh, play, play Dr. No? Is that not true? I oh, wish yeah. it was. <laughs> I don't yeah, want that, though. Sure. Yeah, I don't think he's been associated in the Bond franchise. That's gonna be for the, that, that's gonna be for the next Bond. <laughs> They're gonna remake Doctor No with John Voight. Yes. That's gonna be for another five years from now. With Idris uh, Elba as Bond. I'm down for it. Let's do it. Yeah, we're not gonna get another Bond for another five years, and Elba's gonna have aged out of the role. I don't think we're, that's gonna happen. Uh, no, I, no. Know, that seems like something that the the holders uh, of that license would do purposely just hold on to it so that they don't have to cast him. Eh. But that, it's all right. He's knuckles now, so it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Black don't crack. It's a saying for a reason. He will be able to do that role in 10 years. They don't they he will outlast James Bond. Oh, I I think so, yeah. So, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Anyway, uh <laughs> we got off track. Derek, do you have any last words? No, like I said, it's it's one of the best gamma movies of the show era. There's no denying that. And yeah, it, it's a great time. It's a great little story. It actually has great development human characters too, which you don't really get with a lot of like these show gamma movies. Spoiler alert ahead. There, you know, there's ones that I enjoy a little bit better for monster action reasons, but this one's a good story. It's tight. And you know, for the pay for the 
length of this movie, it has a great pacing. It the really way, does. You know, if, uh, because it's one of the longer Gamera movies, too, you know, if, uh, of these eras, too. So it's 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 pretty great. Good yeah. stuff. Uh, Don, this was your first time watching this movie. Uh, yeah. Coming into seeing the, the second movie in the Showa series... How did you feel about all this? What What's your last words? Um, so my last words, uh, out of the two Gamera Showa era films I've seen, this is my favorite. Um, it's my second favorite out of the four I've seen. Um, yeah, uh, no, I, I, I can't really disagree with anything. Uh, you know, like I said, my the monster action is my favorite part of the film. Um, I had the same issues with Venom did, which I th- think we all do, which is, you know, the lack of Gamera and the you know intelligent co- you know storyline that brings him involved but the rest of the film is a lot of fun uh you know we get shades of king kong versus godzilla which i know you love with the island setting and all of that uh you know there's a great greed storyline and social commentary thrown in uh and you get an adorable cute little monster that you know i i really like so yeah, I, I know we're not going to get anything close to this, um, maybe in terms of filmmaking quality, again, for the rest of the series. Uh, even though I haven't seen them, um, I'm pretty familiar with the GIFs and clips uh, to know that this is going to be the high watermark until we get to the 90s, but... Uh, yeah. Uh, um, I, I, Gamera vs. Yeah. Gauss, the next one, Gamera vs. Gauss, is actually still a good movie. That's my favorite. Um, I, uh, same here. I prefer Gauss. But once you get into, like, Gamera versus, like, Gyrion territory, boy, <laughs> it gets wacky. <laughs> yeah, Gyrion's the best part of that movie. <laughs> Gamera yeah, versus like... Gyrion is best watch as a Mystery Science episode because, holy shit, it is just... Like, watch the English dub. If you can watch the Sandy Frank English dub of that movie... It is the funniest fucking movie ever made. Yeah. Like, <laughs> before, like, after Plan 9 from Outer Space, but before The Room, there was Gamma vs. Garyon. So, uh, God damn, if you're not going to put something like that on the fucking cover, I don't know what you're doing with your life. <laughs> Arrow should have called me. <laughs> I mean, geez, if that's not a fucking cell job of the century... <laughs> Arrow, give us a commentary for that movie. <laughs> you you um, you just need the Mystery Science Theater three thousand episode, and it's because I will say the Mystery Science Theater three thousand, the funniest episode for the Gamera movies they did out of the five, is the Gamera versus Garyon. But we ain't there yet. So Don, continue. Yeah, um, but uh, I, I'm still down. Uh, this is. You know, I'm still interested in this just because of the genre as a whole. And, you, you know, yay, no kids. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, probably, I would say, one of the highlights. I was really expect. I was kind of surprised at, you know, the, how technically well made it was. And uh, I, I really enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun with it. All right. Um, with that being said... Actually, Jer. Uh, yes. One last thing before we move on. <clears throat> this has very. This has absolutely nothing to do with the filmmaking or anything like that. It's just a mistake that they make that really, really irks me. Oh, okay. Uh, five or six times in this movie, they say the term "poisonous scorpions." Folks, if you <laughs> ever say scorpions are poisonous, I will not associate with you. Scorpions are venomous, and it, it, in case anyone knows, I'll give you a quick physiology lesson. Poisonous, uh, for something to be poison, means it has to be ingested. You have to eat it to for it to kill you. Venom needs to be injected directly into your bloodstream, like a snake or a scorpion. Um, I've actually drank rattlesnake venom. I had like a tiny little bit of rattlesnake venom when I worked at a toxicology lab for a little while back in the 90s. And it, it you can drink it and it does nothing. But obviously, if a rattlesnake bites you, you're pretty much dead if you don't get to the hospital in like a half hour. So remember, um, things like nightshade and, uh, you know, whatever else, cyanide, that's poison. What scorpions and spiders have inside of them is venom. 
and it's also my namesake, so I get a little pissy when people say scorpions are poisonous. I, I kind of want to just slap them in the throat. So yeah, that's fair. They didn't know that in 1960 Japan. Bullshit. Okay, <laughs> that's fair. They didn't know that in 1960s New Guinea. There you go. I'll accept that. Uh, fun fact: I moved into an apartment once, and under animals you couldn't have, they had a poisonous section, uh-huh. and under poisonous animals you could not own was piranha. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know piranhas could be poisonous apparently you cannot eat a piranha because they are poisonous according to this apartment in panama city beach florida ah oh, so good um with Speaking that pir- fucking florida. Fish. with that yeah. being said we are now going to move into the ultraman report which i know derek has been waiting on since yesterday I almost messaged you this morning to tell you, hey, do you want to do the Ultraman report because you're so excited for this? But then I forgot. So, (laughs) we are doing episode 24, the Undersea Science Center, which came out on Christmas, December 25th, 1966. Um, uh, This is uh, (coughs) synopsis. When the support line connecting a newly constructed undersea base to the surface world are mysteriously destroyed. Come on, guys. Shouldn't that be surface world is mysteriously destroyed, not are mysteriously destroyed? Yeah, yeah it should be the other. Yeah. Motherfuckers. Yeah. I didn't I didn't uh, grammar check this stuff. Should have sent it to Venom. They He could have yelled at them for getting poisoned and Venom and R and is wrong. Um, <laughs> surface world is mysteriously destroyed. The Science Patrol launches a rescue mission. So here we go. Uh, The Science Patrol uh, is going to go visit an underwater base that they apparently are not told why until they get there. I don't know. That just makes (laughs) fucking sense. It makes no sense. Um, I was dying. And apparently it's because they're going to protect the president of the Science Center. Okay. And a little um, white girl. Oh, and a little white girl. Because, <laughs> uh, obviously that old grandpa is rich and kind of looks like he may hang out with Gamera, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> um. So. The Woody Allen of the show. Yes. Uh, so the little girl Ginny is apparently the 200th guest. Um. So, they take Ginny inside a submarine, and we get to look at all these cool little fish and crabs that are clearly at an aquarium. Yeah. So, there's this episode is filled with this, by the way. We are going to, oh lord, see so many things that just are low budget. Um, but uh, while they're going... Uh, the pipeline gets hit by something underneath, and they see it happen, apparently, but then they don't see it happen, because later on, uh, my wife Fuji thinks she did it, which makes yeah. no sense. They, they did only the little girl saw it, and she didn't tell anyone? Like, I don't understand. But y'all, y'all are with me. They clearly, like, the little girl gets all scared. They, she at least clearly sees it, right? Yeah. She has some. I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced that she actually saw the kaiju, but she definitely saw something. Yeah, no, I, I, I think th- I thought the same thing. Uh, she may not know exactly the kaiju specifically that did it, but, but she definitely saw it happen. Yeah, yeah, so they get there, and um, now only a couple of them go on. Uh, the president and Ginny are there with Hoshino and um, Boss Man. Fuck, what's his name? Miro. Yeah. And uh, so Hoshino goes to show the president uh, around, which immediately stops. Because the next scene, they're all back in the same room. Uh, hey, before, fu- before you go on, I just wanted to mention something about this station there, eh? How is the station not filling up with water? Because half of the station opens up, they let the submarine in. Well, <laughs> if you've ever seen Sea Lab 2021, 
<laughs> not C Lab 2020, by the way, just C Lab 2021. Yeah. Uh, it would be explained to you by Murphy uh, with one word, which is technically two words put together, and that is fig nuts. Oh, okay, I gotcha. <laughs> I'm just thinking too hard, but you know what I mean. It looks like really. <laughs> I don't know. It's it's deep blue sea. You figure it out. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Fuji goes to get the press to from the base, but as she's leaving, she can see the she literally sees the pipeline shooting air up, and she's like, "Oh, I must have hit it." You see it in front. Do you think you hit it on the way? Were you even driving on the way? Who knows? Because I saw you with a little girl looking out of a window. (laughs) Anyway, I'm just saying, Fuji, it's not your fault, baby. Okay? And and, and at this moment is when we see the mysterious drill come out of the ground. Yes. Then we see... uh, the drill come up. It. Uh, I thought we were going to be paying, playing Mr. Driller on the Game Boy Advance. Apparently, we are not. I was very oh. upset about this. I thought we were watching Puppet Master. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, something close to that. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, we then see Captain Mirror and Hoshina as they see this giant drill. Well, they don't see the drill. But it, we see the drill penetrate the docking area of the, the facility. And now we're like, oh, it's a drill. Anyway, all, all, so Fuji, like I said, shows back up and informs the rest of the science patrol that she's like, yo, I think I broke the pipeline by mistake because apparently I'm not fucking paying attention to anything that's going on so they are having trouble contacting mura they finally contact him and learn at the attack of the docks science patrol then is like we have to go save them but and they think they're gonna do it but then i'd's like i mean sorry it's spelled i'd ito's like uh this uh is like a special aluminum titanium thing, and you can't burn through it you can't break through it you can't drill through it unless you have the drill of a certain monster apparently or I guess only the top of it's made of that because there's so much pressure down there that they needed a special type of metal keep that in mind for later on mm-hmm. um, so Ito then goes and tries to figure out how they're going to do it Back at the the science, uh, back with Mira, we learned that the president of this place is an asshole. He's smoking a cigar while oxygen is quickly running out and is upset when he can't smoke his cigar as a little girl passes out. Gamera shows up in the window because a little girl passed out. (laughs) He's the Bill Cosby of this episode. That that didn't happen? Oh, my bad. Um, So... Maybe you've got your uh, pages, you know, pages stuck together there. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> that, that, that was your Zegra notes, Jerry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that was good. That was good. Deep cut, Gary. <laughs> deep cut. Uh, so as the we go back and we see Ido has come up with, they're going to use a vessel known as the Tortoise to rescue them and drain the excess w- water that's flooding them in. Um, we then learn the president is more of an asshole because he tries to open up a fucking door that's going to let, uh, water in and kill everybody. Uh, Captain Mira shuts that shit down. Uh, Jenny is still passed out, though we, I wouldn't have passed out if I would have had Hoshino making cute faces at me. (laughs) Fuck. Sorry, that was a quote from Gamera. (laughs) <laughs> am i taking that too far <laughs> no. okay you're not taking it far enough for the episodes driving you there for which case oh, i don't believe you wait till, you the, wait till they get to the monster battle and yeah. you know squirt and squirt comes up i had no plans to make a bunch of gamma pedophile jokes i did not come into this episode thinking i was going to do that it just keeps presenting itself 
hey, if the episode leads you there, that's not your fault. <laughs> exactly. Um, all, anything that gets you to the wet suit. That's all so the they then get some oxygen tanks out so they can start breathing. But Mira's like, I won't use one because I'm a fucking G and I'm going down with the ship. Um, he is a G. So then we go back to the science patrol as they start swimming down there. We get to see my girl, Fuji, in a diving suit. And it's Woo-hoo. wonderful. I love it. I don't know what's up with the weird Ninja Turtle colors, but I still love it. And Ito's like, yo, if it gets bad, you need to come back. Um, so as they go down there... They then get ambushed by a giant aquatic monster. Um, Arashi and uh, Arashi and Hay- Hayata uh, try to lead the monster away, shoot some missiles at him. At one point, they shoot two missiles, but only show one explode on the monster's ass. Where the other missile went, I have no idea. Maybe that's, you know, the next Philadelphia experiment. Um, so... We go down there. Fuji ends up managing being able to get in. She saves everyone. Uh, but the monster then ends up crashing the ship that Arashi and Hayata are in. Luckily, Arashi passes the fuck out. And Hayata somehow transfers into Ultraman inside of it. But becomes Ultraman outside of it. I'm not 100% sure how the powers of the beta capsule work they seem to get real nightmare on elm street logic with it if you know what i'm saying because even later when ultraman flies away you would think they would have shown ultraman diving back into the ocean so he could get back into the sub but he doesn't he just flies away like normal and then they go back to hiata driving the sub somehow not wet at all and arashi's just like how did you get up there? Oh. And then just lets it go. How do y'all not figure this out yet? Y'all are the science patrol. Y'all are supposed to be extremely smart. And y'all have yet to figure out that he is a fucking body snatched alien. <laughs> anyway. Um, that look, though, that Arashi gives him at the end. It's almost its almost like that's the first... like clue or red light um, and red flag that we're seeing where the, where he's like hmm. it happened in an earlier episode two. Oh, i missed it then yeah um but i can't remember which one but yeah there's also like anytime we like when you're watching fuji swimming underwater i had to watch this a couple of times um on like my eighth time i i was like oh you can see her shadow on the wall right there <laughs> Which is very fun because she's in a pool. Not my pool because I don't own a pool. And that seems like that's a problem with the world. Um, you, can also, you can also play a fun game with this episode where uh, you flip-flop back and forth between underwater scene and perceived underwater scene. And the way to tell is the fact that some scenes will have bubbles. And then literally the very next scene, well, not the next scene, but the next cut in the same scene, all the bubbles are gone. So, yeah, it, uh, it, it's yeah. a fun little game. I, I never noticed because I just died laughing when the fish just came on screen because I was just dying because it... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the monster, which uh, they never say the name of, but apparently is named Gubbala. Gubbala. <laughs> Gubbala. <laughs> <Gubbla. laughs> I'm sure yeah, it's supposed it's to be like Gubila, it's, but... It's Gubila. It's Gubbala. Get the Gubbla. fuck out of here. You're going to look at that thing and tell me it's not Gubbala? I love, I love the size difference because, you know, once he's in the water, he looks kind of smaller in Ultraman, but then he's, like, fucking huge. Okay. <laughs> Derek, that water was cold, okay? I don't think it's fair for you to judge him based on that. So he's like Simon Birch? My male. nuts are like raisin. You're a male, dude. You've never really bothered to know about shrinkage? <laughs> Yeah, Gubbala has Simon, shrinkage. I've seen Simon Birch when they had, were in the water, and Simon Birch is like, my nuts are like raisins. <laughs> Apparently, uh, Derek, though, does not go in cold water, so it's either a hot tub for Derek or nothing at all, ladies. 
Um, with that being said, it is time to hand it over to Don so we can get that ding, ding, ding on a bell. Don, take it over for the fight. All righty. Ultraman flies out of the sub and approaches the charging Gubira, who swims off to the other side of the facility and begins drilling into the base of the mountain. Ultraman follows Gubila, who's drilling up to the surface and approaches the facility on the ground before Ultraman can get out of the tunnel and stops the monster just before he meet- reaches the main building by landing on the creature's back and attempts to steer him away from everything. Gubila bucks Ultraman off, who then charges into the buildings he was approaching, but quickly turns around and faces off against Ultraman, who sidesteps a charge and grabs Gubila around the jaw. However, the creature sprays a stream of water from its blowhole, which staggers <laughs> Ultraman, and sends him to the ground, allowing Gubira to crawl on top of him and stab him with his drill. Ultraman forces several attempts to the side of his head before finally leveraging Gubila to the ground beside him, allowing Ultraman to step back and dodge another charge attempt. Leaping over the creature, Ultraman lands on Kubila's tail and prevents him from getting away until the creature finally shakes him off and tries sailing through the air at Ultraman to impale him with his drill. Again, Ultraman steps aside and hurls Kubila face first into another set of buildings and uses the time Kubila spends riding himself to prepare for an Ultra Slash, only for Kubila to catch it with his drill and send it back at Ultraman. He dodges his own attack and then clips a flying Gubila in the drill, knocking it clean off and sending the monster crashing to the ground. Unable to drill away, the monster roars in defiance, which gives Ultraman the chance to fire the Specium Ray and blast the creature to pieces. This episode is sponsored by the Gubbala Drip Pocket Pussy. You can get one today for... <laughs> Three easy payments of nineteen ninety five and one extremely hard payment. And if you want that horn drill, that costs extra. Um, yeah, so with the people save, Ginny reunites with her father, Albert Fish, and Hayata sneaks... <laughs> I think I killed everyone this time. Yeah, what the hell, man? Okay. Um, and Hayata somehow sneaks back on board with the submarine to save Arashi and returns them back to the center and and that's the end of the episode um I, I, I whoo what an episode this is the little girl called that guy Papa at the end right so that's her dad I, in, in quotation marks yes because that dude's like 90 years older than her He's got to have superstar. It could just be like a papa is a sign of affection. I mean, it's a weird yeah, one. I mean, something yeah, it, could have been lost in translation, I'm sure. But yeah, she just definitively said papa. And I'm like, yeah. ugh. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, it could be like a short for grandpa or his, something like that. His favorite yeah. rapper, uh, the old guy's favorite rapper is Notorious B.I.G. <laughs> Uh, uh, I, I mean, you know, uh, yeah, it, it's weird. It's weird for Papa, but I mean, it could just be like a, you know, a sign of affection or just like, you know, a short sure. form of grandpa. Like uh, I said, it, it could be just a, maybe a mistranslation too on their part since half this episode isn't translated properly. Yeah. Look, I'm oh, just God, glad God. that there's finally representation for us white people in the show <laughs> because I. I'm tired of there not being good representation for white people in Japan shows. I understand Japan is like 90% like just Japanese people and then like 10% melting pot, uh, especially in the 1960s. But God damn it, I'm glad we got representation and I'm super stoked that they were able to get old grandpa and little girl that her next movie is probably fucking Willy Wonka. 
She kind of look. She kind of looks like the fucking kid, the little girl from House by the Cemetery. Yeah, but she kind of looks in like five years. She's going to be the bitch that turns into a blueberry. <laughs> And Albert Fish is her dad. That's great. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, let's talk about this episode, Derek. I'm I'm gonna give you the glorious uh, honor of going first to give us your thoughts on this episode. Yeah, this episode. It's pretty fun. I was, la- you know. It- I was laughing throughout it, you know, with the bad special, you know, the bad special effects cracked me up. Like Ben was saying, the monster underwater was hilarious because it just looked like a little paper mache puppet with a drill nose. It was great. And I even liked the flabby suit of the fucking monster on land. It was fucking hilarious how much extra baby got back that thing had, you know, <laughs> I was just cracking up throughout it. Even like the crazy president was like when he was like, I need to get out of here now. Like, yeah. He literally said, I don't want to die, but I want to open this door that'll kill us all. Yeah. <laughs> I was just cracking up. You know, is it the best episode ever? Probably not. But I I was entertained enough by it. It was cracking me up with all the shittiness that was going on within it. <laughs> you know, so it, I recommend it. It's a good, it's a good breezy episode for shits and giggles. You know, how are you the president of the science committee, and your dumbass doesn't know that that the smoking is going to take up more oxygen, that opening this door is going to get like you're walking in water. You can tell there's a fucking problem, and like this is why I understand we need money to do the science thing, and and. Rich people love just having titles, but you can't give everything to them. You know, no. there. This is a problem. Um, Venom, what are your thoughts on the episode? All right. Well, uh, this episode is an absolute mess. I, I, I mind you, I'm not going to sit here and say that it's necessarily bad or unwatchable, but it really is thus far one of the more poorly put together episodes I've seen as far as like special effects, as far as, far as like how did Gubila even swim? Like he had no way of actually, like his, his fin didn't move. He literally was like swimming through the water with no way of him being propelled. Like he literally had no propelling system. So, you know, a, a lot of suspension of disbelief here. Obviously we're all Kaiju fans, so we're gonna accept it, but yeah. Between the poor special effects, the absolutely ridiculous president who has no balls whatsoever. Um, I did like the kids in this episode. I, I Luckily, we don't get a whole lot of them. I'm okay with the white girl, but as far as the science patrol kid and uh, the little interaction that he had with Jenny, I thought it was cute. It may be an odd time to do it in the middle of a life, death, life and death situation, but whatever. Um, <clears throat> ultimately, though... If you're a fan of the rest of the series, there's no reason not to watch this one. As Derek said, even with all its problems, it still has a lot of charm. There's a lot of uh, good aspects to enjoy. And any episode that gives me Fuji in a wetsuit, I'm down for. So, yeah, I can't complain. I I second that wetsuit. (laughs) I I don't know how many people are going to get this reference for my boy uh, Gubala, Gubala, but Gullah Gullah Island... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you off here because it's kind of bad. Okay. <laughs> um, Don, what did you think about this episode? Um, I'm uh, probably right around with Venom. Um, it's uh, I found it a little underwhelming. Uh, he mentioned a couple of my issues with it. You know the ridiculous, you know the utter stupidity, and you know just sense, you know lack of logical logic and rationale for the situation. I also find it kind of weird that two thirds of the episode is some kind is just basically like a rescue mission trying to figure out how to get out of the the building, but then there's like, you know, there's like nothing else going on. All, we're either just going back and forth between the science patrol trying to open the doors, or we're trying to, or we're seeing, you know, the the group inside. You know, there's no we don't get anywhere else. 
like there's nobody you know, like we don't see anybody else on the surface trying to like send rescue missions and try to like get into contact with anybody it just feels like it's like a it's like a disaster film setup that's just crammed down into 20 minutes uh it it, it just feels like there's a odd left out on the table i mean you know kubila is not even mentioned in the film in the episode we don't even get its name uh it, it just feels like there's a lot missing here that it just feels like it's crammed down from like a longer script into just shoehorned into like this short form episode. But I, I, it's probably got uh, one of my favorite monster battles. Uh, this is, I, I would say one of my top five favorites in the series so far. Uh, you know, Gubila is just a goofy, cheesy, charming creature that, you know, yeah, the special effects to create him are a mess, but the, you know, the execution is a, uh, you know, a lot of she has a lot of charm to it, and it's not necessarily you know the most unwatchable episode. I mean, I I, I do like a lot of um, other episodes less than this, but yeah, uh, the writing to this is uh, terrible, and a lot of the tr the plot points make no sense. But I I've seen worse. We've covered worse in the retrospective, so you know it, it's watchable i'll give it that all right i uh, it's my turn i've made a lot of jokes this episode but it's time to get serious um this is one of the greatest episodes of not only ultraman but tv in general as it has so many levels of social commentary that gets so overlooked uh, from going into the psych, the psych of Fuji, a female, uh, an only female member of an all male group, and how she feels like she has to blame herself for accidents to make sure that the men have reasons to come and save people and fix things is just great social commentary. Having the social commentary of the greedy white man. Uh, needing that title but not understanding anything about what he's putting money into just so he can show off mm -hmm. fantastic commentary having the social commentary about the uh, Japanese man's work life and how they are overworking themselves and care more about their job than their own life with Captain Murrow ready to die for his job is is just absolutely social commentary you just don't get when you need it especially not in the 1960s that's so ahead of its time it is not even funny uh the social commentary we get that ultra man is not ultra woman yet fuji takes the blame it doesn't make sense uh not only that we have the social commentary of gubala not even getting a name, even though it's out there drilling and creating opportunities for gas to come up and release so that we don't have underwater explosions. No one's giving him respect for that. Ultraman is trying to stop that because Ultraman actually works for the big oil companies and is trying to stop Gubbala from finding the oil because Gubbala would have had that oil and let it go free like a 1960s tesla but y'all don't want to hear that y'all want to be like oh we're gonna we're gonna get with ultraman who's throwing dangerous rings and when the ring is thrown back at him because he's a vicious attacker uh does he block it no he lets it just go and destroy things whether it destroyed some uh nice uh house or it destroyed a beautiful piece of of japan's landscape but y'all don't want to talk about that. He destroys a monster and just leaves the carcass there. Just leaves it. Doesn't care about the environmental effects of that. See, what y'all don't get is that I am full of bullshit. And I will come up with any theory like it's the goddamn Shining based off anything. <laughs> um, I think this episode's really fun for how dumb it is. Um... And I think it makes it a joy to watch. Is it the best episode? No. Is it one of the funnest to watch? Absolutely. fucking lootly Hell yeah. Because you can you can make so much fun of it. And it's a good time. Um, and, <laughs> oh, I can't believe I just did that. Anyway. <laughs> I'm a wreck. Um, so... Yeah, I think this is absolutely fun. Shout out to my boy Gubbala representing. 
Uh, Hell yeah, we're gonna get Gubbala shirts on the T Public. What did what did y'all say he was? A a platypus mixed with a narwhal? A narwhal yeah. platypus. Yeah. I love it. I'm I'm a fan of it. Um so yeah, I think you have to watch this episode just to like kinda have fun, cut loose. Um it's just not that serious of an episode. There's there's no social commentary in this. That was I was lying, guys. In case you didn't know. Um, there's Fuji in a wetsuit. That's about there's it. There's Fuji in a wetsuit. That's really the only re- This episode is 10 out of 10 because it's Fuji in a wetsuit. I, I can't wait to give her a, another pearl necklace. Um, Hell yeah. So with that said, guys, we, of course, will see you all next time. But before we do that, of course, we're going to say our goodbyes and tell you well, they're going to tell you what they've been doing on the internet, because I'm just now back to podcasting. Um, but I guess I do have a couple of things. Kill the Cast did drop a episode where me, Jay, and guest Mr. Vin- Venom, filling in for Kenneth, uh, just gave you five streaming recommendations. So go in there, get some movies for your October list, and check that out. Um I did guest spot, even though I recorded uh, like three months ago, I did a guest spot on the Joe Blow Horror Show talking about the original Night of the Living Dead, and um, it was a lot of fun. I came up with some stuff that somehow they never thought of for this movie, and I hadn't heard set anywhere else, so I don't know how that happened, because I think everything's been said for that movie, but if you want to know what I said, check it out. It was a lot of fun, and um, I did some episodes of Married with Children podcast. So there's that. I did Steve's last episode. Um, other than that, this is my newest thing. I'll, I've got stuff brewing, so keep an eye out as I get back into podcasting. I'm sorry for my absence. Health-related stuff. I literally couldn't see. I now get needle shots in both my eyes like a Fulci movie once a month uh, so that I can see and be able to podcast i'm on medicine for my mental health it's going super well um so thank you all for listening and letting me come back with that being said um venom shout out your shit all right obviously you can hear me on no more room in hell along with don uh, excuse me along with derek on the main show no more room in hell our latest episode episode 37 is now available where we looked at a couple of UK 70s horror films. We looked at, uh, what was it, Tower of Evil and Frightmare. And for me, it was called Once Upon a Frightmare in America when it first came out on VHS. Uh, So check that out. That's Uh, a long title. Once Upon a Frightmare in America when it came out? (laughs) (laughs) You bitch. Okay. (laughs) On Fresh Cuts... uh, uh, Another sidecast of No More Room in Hell. Uh, obviously, we look at the newest uh, genre releases. This week, we're going to be looking at Gigi Saul Guerrero's uh, new movie, Bingo Hell, which was just dropped on Amazon Prime on Friday, October 1st. So check that out if you get a chance. And uh, as we continue to expand the No More Room in Hell brand, uh, we have recently created Creature Comforts, which is um, three of us here on this show, Derek, Don, and myself, looking at the greatest creature features uh, in our lives, the ones that have really affected us. We've only recorded one episode so far. And of course, for the first episode, where else do you start? But with 1933's King Kong. Uh, not We haven't made a decision yet on episode two, but that should be out sometime before the end of October. Um, those are all available on the Dark Discussions Podcast Network. And then my other shows, It's Not Horror Okay. Uh, my commentary show is taking October off for horror, as the show is called It's Not Horror. Uh, it just made sense for us to take October off, as the majority of us are horror movie podcasters, and we have other shows and extra things that we're doing for October. So uh, no, uh, it, It's Not Horror Okay will be back in November. In the Mic of Madness will be making its triumphant return this month in October, Rebecca Reinhardt and myself have gotten back together and we are planning our next episode. Look out for that. That'll also now be on the Dark Discussions Podcast Network. And then I have a guest spot. I actually have a guest spot this week on the Joe Blow Horror Show where, uh, believe it or not, we look at Day of the Dead. So we're going to be completing the trilogy that Jerry oh, started. Oh shit! You were, you, were, you were on there too? I love this. I told 
on my episode, I t- <laughs> one of the, the hosts, I told him that he looked like a... I can't remember how I said it, but I basically said he looked like a, a, a fucking failed version of Jaylee Hole Osman. <laughs> so if you've ever seen my boy on that show, you'll know what I'm talking about. And then after the show was done, I just roasted both of them for like fucking 30 minutes. And we should have recorded it. It was so funny. Awesome. Uh, I'll keep it up this week. That'll be uh, that'll be recorded this Wednesday. I'm not sure what their release schedule is, so look for that. Uh, Wait, you you haven't recorded that yet? No, it's this Wednesday. This coming Wednesday, uh, we're doing Day of the Dead. Bro. I was going to be on last week with Carly uh, to do the Dawn of the Dead remake, but unfortunately I had a scheduling conflict, so I'm going to be here this week for Day of the Dead. So that'll be fun. I was going to say, I recorded mine literally like... In July? Yeah, that's yeah. weird. I, I guess they're taking their sweet time. I, I mean, who knows? <laughs> I, I, I don't really... Um, I haven't really communicated with Cole much before. He hit me up recently asking me to be on the show. But honestly, you know, I, I knew of him. But I guess, never really exchanged two words with him. So I guess Cole got really, really uh, busy trying to find his podcast host who got turned into a walrus. Yikes. <laughs> you got killed by Ultraman in this episode. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Gumbel the uh, RIP. Very nice. Um, and uh, what else? Uh, oh, and uh, the last guest spot I have is with uh, Bo from Legion Podcast. I was actually able to be on episode number one of his new show, The Dark Parade, where we, did, we had an in-depth conversation on the original Psycho. And I will be joining Bo again uh, later this week or early next week uh, to continue the Psycho franchise. I'm not sure I'll be there for all four episodes, but I was there for one. I'll definitely be there for Psycho 2. Uh, I wonder if anyone's got dibs on Psycho 3. I fucking love Psycho 3. Oh, can you tell him now? Book it. He'd be very happy to record with you. Oh, I'm about, I'm about to message Bo. Do it. Do it. Uh, and yeah, that's it for me, Jer. Okay, uh, Derek, what do you got? Uh, Cinema Attack, we just finished recording our new, our first of two Halloween episodes where we take a look at Trick or Treat and Night of the Demons, uh, two 80s Halloween classics. And uh, yeah, we also have planned another episode that I'm not going to announce right yet, but it's going to be Halloween related. You know, we're keeping it festive for this time of year. Uh, CDR, or Celluloid Dissections Redux, I'm probably going to end up saving because I'm just waiting on the outro. I'm trying to edit the outro slowly, getting it right. You know, I'm just trying to get everything right. But I'll probably save those for after October because they're non-horror discussions mostly. So those should be pumping probably in the beginning of November, the resurrection of that show finally coming out. But uh, also, they're here. We have an episode out where uh, we did the original Poltergeist. Uh, still playing because... Lacey's just busy with the uh, cut to the cartoon commentaries and all that good stuff right now because it's the Halloween season. Everyone's busy, you know. Uh, also, you could find me on the Legion Patreon where I do Blood from the Core with Gary Hill, which is a show that we look at New York based horror and thriller movies. Our last episode was actually Cue the Winged Serpent, and uh, uh, our next episode's a uh, I actually forget the movie. It's been a while. I have to actually look the chat, but it's going to be another New York based movie. Uh, I'm thinking of No More Room in Hell, of course. I'm just trying to name the stuff Venom already hasn't named. Uh, yeah, that's about it for me. All right. Don, what do you got? All right. So, uh, in addition to the uh, aforementioned titles, uh, No More Room in Hell's Creature Comforts and Fresh Cuts, uh, the only other. Uh, I, the only thing for me is uh, two guest spots. Um, I did one with uh, some friends of mine on Phantom Galaxy, where we did a uh, general retrospective on Indonesian horror. Uh, we basically just went around and uh, talked about like six or seven different films and just you know gave our thoughts on the state of the genre cinema over there and all that good stuff. Uh, that should be out. Uh, 
Well, by the time you hear this, um, I'm not I'm not sure what their release schedule is because I, uh, we recorded it two weeks ago. So um, it should be out right around the time that you hear this. And the other thing is a uh, guest spot on Indie Film Cafe. It's 31 Days of Indie Horror, where um, I looked at the uh, recent uh, slasher film Butchers, which uh, wasn't really that good, but um, you'll have to listen to the episode to find out why. Uh, that one should be dropping... Uh, he said it was t- going to be tor- towards the end of the month because he was uh, recording these uh, in advance. So uh, he's going to be dropping one a day. Um, it's going to be 31 Days of Indie Horror. Uh, so uh, he said it was supposedly uh, sometime after the 25th. I'll have to check. Uh, I'll have to check the chat to know for sure. But he said sometime after the 25th it'll be released. So, um, yeah, uh, be on a lookout for that one. It'll be on uh, Indie Film Cafe Network and uh, Phantom Galaxy. Uh, you can find that online under their name. So, um, like I said, other than that, uh, it's the uh, two shows with uh, under the Doma Room and Hell banner. Okay, that reminds me. Uh, Venom, we got to pick a day this coming week to do our uh, Beast thing for Gary. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm still waiting for my 4K to get here so I can, because uh, I want to rewatch it on 4K since it's available. But yeah, it should Fair. be here any day and then yeah, whenever you're ready. Okay, dope. Uh, also, I'm going to start a new podcast called Space Ghost Cast a Cast where we talk about the violation of life that happens when tyrical space adventures happen by people who think they have superpowers and run amok. <laughs> this is not true. Uh, I'm I want not... to Zorak. I'm not doing that, but apparently Venom is going to be on another podcast and he will play the Zorak character as we talk about the tyranny that is uh, 80s, the 70s and 80s cartoons um, and the violation of not only human rights, but any living creature's rights. So we will take shots at um, Space Ghosts, uh, the Herculoids. Um, Harvey Birdman. Harvey uh, Birdman, Birdman, attorney at law, uh, will be representing us when we eventually get sued by uh, Hanna Barbera. Yep. <laughs> With that being said, guys, we are out of here. Thank you for joining us for our Visions of Monsterland. We hope you had a good time, and we're back. Love us. We will see you next time. Check out this podcast and many other podcasts. Uh, that are on Kill the Cast and on Legion Podcast Network, which this podcast is greatly a part of, and all the shows that all my fellow podcasters do with Venom, Derek, and Don taking up 90% of all podcasts on the airwaves. (laughs) Thank you very much, Uh, and good night. Pour out a little hard liquor for Gubbalo, (laughs) yo. Later. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcasts, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Mental Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick Six Movies, the podcast by the Cemetery, the podcast on Haunted Hill, the Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which Versus the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.